hope you're on a journey through the Bible to experience the epic story of God and to learn your part to play in the unfolding drama. Prepare for your role as you learn your history, your enemy, and your king. Welcome to the Bible Brief. Join us today as we review the people we've met from the Kingdom Era through the Division Era. God is writing His story through the lives of people we should know. You're listening to The Bible Brief. In the Bible, it's easy to get lost in the sea of names that we read. But these names are not just names. They're people. People core to the story that God has been developing from those very first two people. People both good and bad, who further develop the promises of God, and who are referenced throughout the remainder of the Bible. So as we review the story so far, we need to keep a close eye on the people involved. As the people of Israel entered the Promised Land, and the leadership of Joshua came to an end with his death, we met the Judges. And remember, the Judges were the leaders that God raised up to deliver the people of Israel from their enemies in the land. In this time period, we saw a four-part cycle, where first, the people turned from God to worship other gods. Second, God gave them over to their enemies. Third, the people cried out to God for salvation. And fourth, God raised up a judge to save the people from their enemies. This cycle is the unifying characteristic of the time of the Judges. And in the book of Judges, we saw story after story of this cycle as the people continued to repeatedly rebel against God. During this time, we met one of the judges named Gideon. Gideon is notable as the judge who led 300 men against the Midianite army of 135,000. Through Gideon, God delivered the nation once again, and we learned that when God is involved, numbers don't matter, only God's power does. As the era of the judges wound to a close, we found the people increasingly discontent with the leaders that God had given them. Instead, they wanted to be like other nations. They wanted a king. It's at this point that we met the prophet Samuel. When the people of Israel reject God as king over them, God sends Samuel to warn them about the ramifications of a human king. These warnings include that the king will tax them, conscript them into his army, among other effects. But the people still want a king, despite the consequences. So God has Samuel anoint Saul as the first king of Israel, pouring oil on his head, a symbolic act representing his commissioning to a new office. Saul will be king. Soon after Saul becomes king, however, he offers a sacrifice not permitted in the law that God had given the nation. As a result of this disobedience, God says through the prophet Samuel that the kingdom is being taken away from Saul to be given to another, a man after God's heart. Quickly we meet the next king, David, also anointed by the prophet Samuel to the kingly office. David is perhaps the greatest king in the history of Israel so far, and God uses David to accomplish great victories for the Israelites. As the people continue the campaign to drive out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, David becomes famous for his military might and trust in the Lord for victory. After many such victories, and upon the completion of building his own palace in Jerusalem, we soon see David's desire to build a permanent temple. He wanted to build a permanent place for God to be in place of that tabernacle that had been in use since the wilderness with Moses. While God rejects having David build the temple, he responds to David's desire with great promises. These are the Davidic covenant, the promises of a dynasty, a throne, and an everlasting kingdom ruled by one of David's seed. These promises heighten the expectation of the seed of Eve who will defeat evil, the seed of Abraham who will bless all the nations of the world. And now the righteous seed of David, who will rule on David's throne over an everlasting kingdom. Yet even this great King David, to whom God made amazing promises, expresses his own internal corruption. David, though great, was far from perfect. In just a few pages, we learned about his coveting of another man's wife, his adultery with her, and the murder of her husband. David's great rule is marred by this awful, sinful scandal 
and the rest of his reign would be plagued with internal conflict and rebellion among his household as a consequence. David's reign is followed by his son, King Solomon, the one who builds God's temple in Jerusalem. Solomon was known especially for his wisdom as he ruled over the kingdom of Israel. He increased the prosperity of the nation and eventually became internationally famous for his wisdom. This prosperity was exemplified in the beautiful temple he built for God, beautifully and artistically made of cedar and gold, a symbolic reminder of the Garden of Eden. And yet with similar temptation toward women as his father David, Solomon disobeys God's law regarding wives from other nations. Solomon ends up with a lot of wives, many of whom he gained for political alliance with other nations. In fact, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. We have to wonder how he even remembered their names. Now, this sin of Solomon had severe consequences. God announced that he was going to split the nation into two in the next generation. Ten tribes would ally to the north and two tribes to the south. The united kingdom of Saul, then David, then Solomon, would give way to an era of division. Solomon's son Rehoboam becomes the next ruler, and just as soon as he begins to lead the nation, he makes a very unwise decision. He increases the labor of the tribes who had already labored for years under his father Solomon. This decision catalyzes the split in the kingdom, where ten tribes rebel with their own king, the rebel Jeroboam. So it happens that in the first generation of these split kingdoms, the southern kingdom of two tribes is ruled by Rehoboam, while the northern ten tribes are ruled by Jeroboam. Jeroboam is very rebellious as he reigns over the northern kingdom of Israel. In an echo of Aaron way back at Mount Sinai, Jeroboam sets up two golden calves in the north and causes the people to begin speedily heading toward judgment by God. Generations after this initial rebellion of Jeroboam, we came to meet the wicked king Ahab and the prophet Elijah. Ahab was even more wicked than that first king Jeroboam, and he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. It's in the midst of his reign that we're introduced to Elijah. Elijah the prophet has a miraculous ministry that includes the first recorded resurrection in the Bible when he raises a widow's son from the dead. Perhaps the pinnacle of Elijah's ministry, however, occurs when he challenges the prophets of Baal. He challenges them to see whose God is the real God. The prophets of Baal offer sacrifices and Baal the fake God doesn't hear or respond to the prophets. Because after all, Baal is a fiction. Yet upon Elijah offering a sacrifice and reminding the people of their identity as God's chosen people, Yahweh the true God responds by consuming the sacrifice in fire from heaven. Elijah becomes emblematic of God's constant mercy toward Israel, calling them back from their rebellion through the mouth of his prophets. And yet, despite many prophets being sent to Israel, they continue in their obstinate ways. The northern kingdom is finally conquered by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. They continued to walk in ways disobedient to God, and God judged the nation for their sins. After this flyover of the northern kingdom of Israel, we shifted back to the southern kingdom of Judah, where we mentioned three notable kings of Judah. First was Hezekiah. It was during Hezekiah's reign that Assyria attempted to continue their push into the land, coming all the way to the city of Jerusalem. Their leader sent heralds to intimidate the people in the city. But Hezekiah prayed to God with faith that God could deliver the nation as he had many times before. God responds to Hezekiah's prayer, and the angel of the Lord strikes down 185,000 Assyrians encamped outside of Jerusalem. God, by his power, had delivered the people once again. Despite this deliverance, however, near the end of Hezekiah's days, we saw him proudly parade messengers from Babylon around Jerusalem, showing these Babylonians the spoils for the taking if Jerusalem were captured. Immediately, we begin to hear the prophets warn of Babylon conquering the southern kingdom. After Hezekiah, we see his wicked son Manasseh rule as king over the southern kingdom of Judah. Manasseh's evil is even compared to the inhabitants of the land that were driven out from before the Israelites by Joshua's generation. Again during Manasseh's reign, 
we hear of the coming disaster developing for the kingdom of Judah. Finally, the last king we met was Josiah, who led the final big revival of the nation as he helped to turn the people back to God and his law. It's for his sake that God delays the Babylonian conquest of the land, because God was pleased with Josiah for honoring him. But eventually, the inevitable occurs. Babylon finally conquers Judah a few generations later, in 586 BC, when the temple is destroyed. The people are driven out of the land of Canaan, just as they had driven out the people from before them. God was displeased with his people, but he wasn't done with his people. The exile is going to be a rough time for the people, but it's during this time that we learn a lot more about the next phase of God's plan in world history. The scope of the Bible story is about to broaden in a dramatic fashion. We've been focused on Israel for a time, but God's plan has always been about the whole world. Join us next time as we learn about the future, the near future and the far future, the kingdoms of the world and the kingdom of God. Next time, we meet an exiled prophet and see him reveal the worldwide plan of God. For Bible readings, reflection questions, and quizzes, don't miss the Bible Brief app. Available on iOS and Android, so you can go deeper into the story. The Bible Brief is a project of the Bible Literacy Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to helping you learn the Bible. Give to support the Bible Brief by visiting BibleBrief.org or tap the Give link in the show notes. Thank you for supporting the Bible Literacy Foundation.